an Australian paper, the Courier Mail. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it may be Brisbane, although I'm not actually positive where in Australia it's coming out of. The headline, this is from six days ago. The headline is, don't freak out. Catching COVID after you are vaccinated improves immunity. Subheadline, if you are fully vaccinated against COVID, the next step to improve your immunity may be to actually catch the virus. Now, at first pass, this looks like complete lunacy and looks like they're just you know, throwing up their arms and, you know, saying anything they feel like saying at any moment, because that has certainly not been the approach in the past. There is also built into this the um, idea that we are hearing, but I have yet to see any data to support the idea of quote unquote super immunity, wherein the acquired immunity you get from the actual disease um, is enhanced by also getting the vaccine. And now they're arguing vice versa, like that there is some enhanced immunity from actually having both exposures as opposed to just having had the disease versus just having had the vaccine. Put that aside for a moment, whether or not that is true or not. It's hard to imagine what the immunological mechanism might be, but you know, you think not? Okay. Oh, I think I think it is almost certain that this is true at some tiny level. At some tiny level. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, that that actually doesn't necessarily matter here. What what does matter is if if in Australia, a country that has been going, you know, guns blazing on everyone absolutely must get vaccinated, if what they're saying is, and you know, again, another thing that is that this is hinging on is the idea that having been vaccinated, uh, we're we're now admitting that actually it doesn't really stop transmission very much. But what what they are saying is that it will reduce um, the impact of the disease on you. Maybe true, maybe not. Uh, but if that is if if that is the case, they are saying, look, you're going to run into the disease. They're basically assuming endemism. You're going to run into the disease. Just just deal with it. You'll be fine. Now, you aren't necessarily going to be fine. There are people who've died after getting COVID, after having been fully vaccinated. And there are lots and lots of people who get COVID who do just fine, right? It has an incredibly variable effect on people. But to me, what this what this says, if we are to take it at face value, is okay then. Vaccinated or not, you're going to run into this. What we need is early treatment. What we need is to use the wide array of drugs that we have available to us uh, to deal with treating people as they show up. And hey, it looks like uh, vaccinated people and unvaccinated people are both likely to run into this. And really, there's no reason to be um, pitting those populations against one another in the political sphere, in the media, unless what you're doing is not does not have anything to do with public health or about COVID at all, unless what you were trying to do is create division among populations. Create division among populations or sell one product. Um, uh, yes. To, and to you know, I don't, I don't know enough about the recent politics in Australia to know, but if that headline came out in the US, um, I would be responding with, okay, clearly we've moved from Trump derangement syndrome to COVID derangement syndrome. And there's just, there, there's no ability to have a conversation about this that has nuance that says, terrible virus, terrible disease. Let's figure out how best to move forward because actually we have shared fate here, people. Yeah. Um, I would add to your, your list of things we should obviously be doing, you know, the elephant in the room increasingly is properly preparing with vitamin D, for example, right? Oh. This is the lowest, lowest hanging fruit on the tree. And yet we don't recommend it, which suggests that we are not actually all that concerned at the public health level. We are apparently either completely inept or, um, not that concerned about your actual health and we're doing other things. I would say, I mean, so obviously adding things to a list that is the simplest makes it less simple, <laughs> but, um, the three maybe top things on my list of what, uh, what a country or a world that was actually interested in public health in light of this particular virus and disease would be to encourage um, supplementation of vitamin D in any population where uh, they are likely to be deficient in it, which is to say um, the the higher latitudes you're higher longitudes you're at no nope. higher latitudes you're at rather and um, the more likely you are to be spending time inside which also correlates that's one um, recommending that people go outside that people spend time outside that people get their exercise outside that people socialize outside yep. not just for vitamin D reasons but because this virus isn't transmitting outside still and then third and this does take resources and it does take money and it will take time, but in improving the filtration systems of indoor air. Because in you know the smaller the space you're in with other people, the more likely are that you are breathing in air that they have exhaled. 
this is part of why, this is a big part of why this virus and like all respiratory viruses are more likely to spread inside. So we need to be focusing on filtration and, you know, airlines are doing it. And yes, those are very small spaces and, and very, you know, very easy to control, but we have the technology and it will take some time. It will take some money, but this is the way to make people more safe going forward. Every tool at our disposal. Mm -hmm. It really ought to be. Um, all right. So if we can return for a second to uh, the question of where we are, we've got something that masquerades as consensus. But mm -hmm. the point is, whatever that thing is, it is coercion dependent, coercion dependent consensus. The implication of it is roughly the opposite of uh, of an actual consensus. It's closer to a hostage video in which somebody says some things because there's a gun pointed at them. Mm -hmm. um, it is also, uh, you know, we've heard Chomsky's phrase, the manufacture of consent is resonant, but there's a way in which we are seeing the inverse of many things. And even though it's an easy extrapolation, we don't get the implication. And so um, the manufacture of consent is the mirror image of um, the destruction of dissent, which is what we are mm. seeing. Those who dissent about uh, either you know, sex and gender issues and claim that there's some substantial difference between males and females, mm -hmm. right? Or those who uh, claim things against the public health narrative are punished severely, resulting in a much tinier number of people willing to say these things out loud. And in fact, lots of people will lie to themselves. Um, so, you know, the destruction of dissent is, is, uh, yep. is key to how this works. Um, so I'm not sure how much how much more there is to say. I did have a thought about uh, in light of the role that the you know that we have we have seen played by YouTube in particular. It did occur to me that there is room for uh, us to do YouTube a favor, and oh. uh, we've done a little pro bono work generating a, a slogan. Uh, for the people who generate the um, the community guidelines. And the slogan is going to be something like YouTube community guidelines because you can't handle the truth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Yes. All right. I think, I think that works. 